Hello there and welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for joining me. In this short lesson, we are going to look at measured risks. Now, at heart, backgammon is a game of risk and reward. It's a game of economics where you choose to make wise, sensible investments, hoping for a big payout in the future. So we're going to look at a few positions to demonstrate these ideas of risk and reward. So let us begin. Now, in this first position, white has a 6-1 to play. Now, notice the score, it's 0-0 in a match to 7. And green has one checker on the bar. So how do we go about playing this 6-1 as white? Now the right move here is to play 20 to 14 coming off the anchor and then splitting the checkers 10 to 9. Now the first thing before we make any checker play in any given situation is that we scan the four quadrants of the board. And by doing that we notice that green's front position is very vulnerable. He has two checkers exposed in his home board to blots. Um, and that means we can take more risks. We can exploit the vulnerabilities in green's front position. So that invites us to leave the anchor with 2014. But why not continue to 2013? Why exactly is that an error, as we can see on the left-hand panel? Why with the one do we instead play 10 to 9? Now, here there is logic, of course, behind this decision. Now, if we think about what the position looks like after we have made the correct play. So here we can see the resulting position after white has played. Now really here green only has one good roll, which is actually a joker of double four. So one roll in 36 green has, which would play well. If he were to roll a double four here, of course, he could enter from the bar. He could cover his two blots and he could hit us as well. So that would be a tremendous swing by green rolling a double four here. However, what if green doesn't roll a double four 35 times out of 36? Well, if green were to roll, for instance, a four one, then the four comes in from the bar, but then how does he choose to play the one? Does he make his own two point, safetying those blots in his home board, or does he hit us in the outfield, thus exposing himself to getting hit back uh, when we enter from the bar? And of course, he'll be very exposed in the outfield as well. And we have the stronger home board. So really here, there are not any downsides. The only downside is double four. But there is also another reason why this is a correct play, 20 to 14, 10 to nine. And that is because we want to complete a full closeout. We want to make our four point, And then, of course, we are playing on for two good. Now, by splitting 10 to nine, we have more than doubled our opportunities to close our four point. Now we have seven rolls to make our four point if green dances. And of course, if green doesn't dance and enters, we can also make the four point on his head with those same seven numbers if he stays back. Now, if instead we played 20 to 13, then we would only have three numbers to make the four point instead. So here, even though we are told to not leave blots on both sides of the board, here we take a little risk of green potentially rolling a double four to have a much bigger reward of us now having seven rolls as opposed to three rolls to close our four point board. So it may look risky, but the payoff is simply better. So here we can see, yes, five blots around the board, but it's strategic. It diversifies our numbers to make the four point and green is in a vulnerable position even after he rolls a good number. So 
there we are let's look at the second position now here white has a 5-1 to play again it's 0-0 in a match to seven now how does white choose to play this 5-1 Now, well done if you got this one correct, but the correct move is 14 to 9, 13 to 12, as you can see. And actually, the second best move, which is close, also slots the back of the 5 prime. Now, anything besides slotting the back of a prime would indeed be a very big blunder. So we can see there playing safe, 13, 8, 7, 6 would indeed be a very big mistake. Now, here... It looks risky by slotting the back of the prime because we are then giving greens sixes to hit us and green has a four point board, has a stronger home board. So why are we taking that risk as white to give green a direct six to hit us? Well, here we need to think. If green rolls a six, he has won pretty much regardless. So in that case, it's better to slot the back of the prime. Now we have an anchor in his home board. So even if we are hit by a six, we still can play a holding game, of course, if we don't get doubled out. But here, the advantage of us slotting the back of the prime is if green doesn't roll a six. And of course, green is not a favorite to roll a six. Only 11 in 36 rolls are a direct six. So 25 out of 36 times, green is not rolling a six. And if that does happen, then we as white have 16 rolls to make a six prime. Now, if we make the blunder play 13 to eight, seven to six, and then green does escape with a six, our game winning chances as white actually drop by around 40%, depending on what green rolls with the six. So here you can see slotting the back of the prime, you are playing to win. Now, as a general rule of thumb, if you have a five prime, it's always good to slot the back of the five prime. But with a four prime, it's often correct to play safer. So here we are taking a small risk by making that slotting play. But of course, if green doesn't roll a six, we are in a very strong position. And also we are moving towards an efficient cube ourselves with green stuck back there behind our prime structure. Now let's look at another position, a final position here. Now, this is a little similar. The match score again is to seven, but the cube has been turned and is on green side, as you can see. Now here, how do we choose to play 3-1 as white? Now, here we make a double slotting play. We slot both the back and the front of the five prime. Now five primes are incredibly strong. Now you can see that if we were to make the safer play 12 to eight, then that would be an error. So here we make the double slotting play. Now it's worth mentioning that if the cube was centered, then it would be actually correct to make the second best play there 12 to 8 and we will talk about that in the moment but with the cube on the opponent's side we play 12 to 9 and 4 to 3 so here again like before we are taking risks because of course we may be hit but the rewards are huge now here we are really only giving green a super joker of 6-2 to pick up both checkers. Now, if green were to only roll a 2, now some rolls with 2 don't actually play too well, like 2-1, two, 2-3, one, two, double 2 is not so good. Green would still have that back checker stuck behind our prime formation. So really, like we saw before, 
Green really only has one super joker here in this position. Now, of course, if Green does not escape or does not hit us, then we have 24 out of 36 rolls to make the six prime as white. So again, we take the risk and we have the big reward. Now, as I mentioned before, if the cube was centered, then this would actually be a double pass um, before the move had been played, before we make the slotting play. But let's say you, you missed that double pass uh, scenario. Now here, the reason why it is correct to play from 12 to eight if the cube was centered is because we are moving to a position where we have an efficient cube. So we are edging towards a win. We are edging towards a double pass. Now, let me just go back and show that to you. So here you can see the move with the cube on the opponent's side, but it would be correct here if the cube was centered to play 12 to eight, because then we are just going to double green on the next roll if he doesn't roll a 2-6 and then he's going to pass so we don't need to take any undue risks. However, that is not the situation here. The cube has been turned already and when the cube has been turned then we can play bolder when the cube is on our opponent's side and that is because we are unable to double our opponent out and we are effectively playing the game to 100% rather than the 75% that we need to have an initial double. So when the cube is on our opponent's side, we can play bolder, almost as if we are playing DMP and chasing the wins, but if the cube was centered, then we are just moving to an efficient position. So, there's a lot to be said about positions of cubes and I hope to do a video on that at some point in the future. But the content of this video was mainly about risks and measured risks. So you can see that diversifying your numbers to make your home board stronger, slotting the back of five primes to make it on the next go, then sometimes when you really have nothing to lose, then you have to play to win. And these small risks do have big gains if they succeed, which they often do. So take risks and reap the rewards. Thank you very much for watching this video. Hope to see you next Wednesday. All the best. Goodbye.